Because women's football matters. It's August 12th, 2023, in Brisbane. The Australian women's national team, known as the Matildas, secured their place in the quarterfinals as a group winners ahead of Nigeria, following a 2-0 victory in the round of 16. France also advanced as group winners by defeating Morocco in the round of 16. That evening, almost 50,000 spectators gathered in the sold-out Brisbane Stadium to witness one of the most remarkable matches in World Cup history. I still struggle to describe the France game. To go more in depth on what happened before, during and after the World Cup, we have some amazing guests for you. Uh, so my name is Sam Lewis. Uh, I'm uh, the women's football journalist for Australia's public broadcaster, the ABC. Um, I've been writing about women's football for a very long time for a whole bunch of different publications. Uh, as most people in our industry did, I started as a volunteer and a freelancer, just writing about the game because I loved it and it wasn't getting anywhere near as much coverage as what I felt like it deserved. But I had no idea that women's football journalism could ever be a job. So I never studied journalism. I never pursued anything professionally down that road. Um, but I had a big turning point in 2019 when I went to the Women's World Cup and, and started to write some stories uh, for in a paid capacity. Before we'll go more in depth with Sam on the World Cup and what happened after, Moya, who played in the 1980s for the Matildas and actually was their vice captain back then, will tell us a little bit about what it was like back then and what it was like to play in the first ever try out FIFA World Cup. I grew up in Adelaide in Australia and it was not a football town unless you mean an egg-shaped football, which uh, we call Australian rules. Um, so I grew up uh, there. My dad was a fireman, so we lived in a fire station. Um, I liked to kick the football at school with the, the boys mostly, and uh, but it was um, an egg-shaped ball. So it took me a while to discover a round ball and I really didn't appreciate or start to appreciate the game because I didn't see it uh, until we got a television when I was about 10 years old. And I saw uh, match of the day once a week for an hour. And I just thought it was marvelous. I couldn't, I was quite captured by it. Um, you know, the pattern of movement of the ball, the the movement of the players, um, the the atmosphere in the stadium, I, I was just quite addicted to it. So um, of course, I didn't have a team at that point, so it took another few years before I found a team. Um, women's football was very small in my city uh, in those years. Um, Australia has a lot of immigrants in the country, as you probably know, and it was really the English uh, and the British immigrants who came to Adelaide um, in the 1960s who were the foundation of women's football, um, of course, there were many other Europeans there in, as part of post-war migration, but I think it's fair to say it was the British ones who who started it off most strongly for women. So um, I was, uh, I think, 13 when I saw, I found the scores in the newspaper and I realised there actually was a league for women and that I could play in it. And I got very excited and went off to my local team um, and uh, and played enthusiastically ever since. I saw that you went to the 1998 World Cup um, in China and it was kind of this, if I understand it correctly, this kind of tryout tournament to have maybe a Women's World Cup, a FIFA Women's World Cup. Can you maybe talk us through what that was like? That was um, really a turning point, I think, for the game. It was 1988 and interestingly, you might have uh, seen the movie Copa, Copa 71, which is about the 1971 kind of unofficial Women's World Cup. So after that, FIFA 
made sure that there was no women's football happening outside the um, scope of the federations, that the federations clamped down on anything that was sort of growing wild around the edges. Um, but at the same time, they didn't really do anything with it, sadly. So from 1971, it took until 1988 for FIFA to hold any kind of women's tournament or even a women's match. As far as I know, the very first match that FIFA ever organised of women's football was um, one that I played in. It was Australia against Brazil. It was the first match of that tournament. Uh, it wasn't the official opening match because that was played, of course, by China, but it was played in the evening and ours kicked off in the afternoon. So actually, by the clock, ours was the first match. And I don't think we quite appreciated at the time how historic that was. Um, we knew the tournament was very, very important because, you know, finally, after all these years, we had FIFA considering having a women's tournament. And, you know, this, of course, changes the whole atmosphere because if your international governing body doesn't even bother organising any games for you, then, you know, everything's a friendly. Well, we didn't think about friendly because that was all we knew. But looking back, you'd say everything is a friendly also, the Olympic Committee ignores you because the International Federation hasn't organised any matches. Um, so in their eyes, you, you kind of don't exist until your International Federation acknowledges you. Um, and, you know, government funding, sponsors, all of those things are pretty much non-existent until you're able to get formal recognition as a sport. Um, of course, also around that time, the World Cup 2023 was voted to go to Australia. What was your initial reaction to that or what were your hopes with, with that decision? Um, oh, well, that, that was after I had left the board, uh, but I was involved in the bid committee and I was very excited to bring the World Cup to Australia. Um, I think, you know, I'd been to several World Cups. Um, I like the Women's World Cups more than the Men's World Cups, I've got to say. Um, they have a fabulous vibe. Um, the people are terrific. There's never any trouble uh, amongst the fans, and there's a really nice sense of um, of celebration. Really, that's you know that it, win, lose, or draw. There, there's just a sense that the occasion is being celebrated and the progress that we've all made is being celebrated. So I love the Women's World Cup. I, I was really excited to bring it to Australia because I felt that it was a big opportunity for cultural change around the way the sport of football is perceived in Australia and also the way that women's sport is perceived in Australia. So uh, I, I guess those those two things were, I, I felt the World Cup were, were opportunities to completely transform the way that football is perceived and um, to also showcase incredible sportswomen athletes at, at the peak of their game and have them seen as uh, as athletes first rather than as these sort of curious creatures who are playing a man's game, which I think is how players were perceived in, in my era. And, um, yeah, it really was a, a, a milestone of many decades of development, but it really accelerated the way that sportswomen are perceived the way that um, gender equality is promoted, the way that women's sport seems to adopt a social purpose, which is around empowerment and equality and inclusion. And that came through loud and clear uh, at the Women's World Cup last year, I thought. And it's left a, a lasting impression on Australia and I hope the world that you know this is what women's sport is about. It's finally happened. The World Cup 2023 went to Australia and New Zealand, with the help of Moya, actually, who was on the bid committee. Now Sam, who covered for the World Cup for the ABC, will talk us through what it was like to be there. So when it came to the 2023 Women's World Cup here in Australia and New Zealand, I mean, it, it, it just blew all of that out of the water, especially here in Australia, where football has really struggled at times to be uh, sort of popular with the mainstream. We have a number of other sports down here and other competitions that really dominate the media landscape and uh, sort of the wider conversation. But the Women's World Cup really for the first time brought football, specifically women's football, to the consciousness of the country. And we saw across the world that there were 
Again, broadcast records that were smashed. Social media engagement was through the roof. Merchandising, basically any metric that you can measure. The uh, the Women's World Cup last year seemed to surpass. And that's just so exhilarating. It's so exciting working in this space and having watched it grow specifically over the last two years, how rapidly things have changed um, and how quickly it seems like the rest of the world is finally getting on board with this thing that so many of us have loved and have been shouting about for such a long time. Um, yeah, so covering the the Women's World Cup for for the ABC and being here on home soil to be able to tell the stories of women's football in Australia to the whole world was one of the greatest privileges of my whole life. And I want to talk to you a bit in depth about the World Cup and what it was like for you to cover it and to experience all that. Maybe can you talk us through the opening match? I mean, of course, they moved stadiums and it it had this big attendance and all of that. And it was, I don't know how it was for you, but for me, it was maybe a bit surprising that so many people came and that it got this much attention. Surprising for us too. <laughs> it was it was a real shock. Um, yeah, the opening game of the Women's World Cup was wild for a couple of different reasons. Uh, for folks who kind of arrived uh, in Australia and New Zealand, maybe the week before the tournament, you maybe got a sense that the countries were really getting around it. But for the months kind of leading up, it really didn't feel like anything was happening. There weren't any banners or um, flags or stages or any activations that FIFA was running. There was kind of nothing going on in the host cities around both of our countries. But it was really uh, the week before the tournament kicked off that things started to really come alive. You saw the media start to really get around it. There were lots of appearances of players and coaches and, you know, everything started to ramp up really quickly. And so when it came to that first game, all of that really quick and rapid momentum seemed to just sort of coalesce in this extraordinary sellout game at Stadium Australia. 75,000 people turning out for the Matildas' first game against the Republic of Ireland. Um, I've never been in a stadium that has been so full for a women's match before, and especially not for a Matildas match as well on home soil. I mean, it blew the the old record out of the water by tens of thousands of people. But it was also a very emotional game, not just because of that moment and seeing the whole country uh, finally waking up to the Matildas, but it was also for us rusted on Matildas fans a really difficult moment because it was only maybe two hours before kickoff that we realized that Sam Kerr, the captain, had torn her calf muscle and she wouldn't actually be appearing in the game. And I remember walking around the stadium uh, as the news was slowly rippling out across the crowd and you could just feel the the energy in the air turned from real excitement to almost dread and terror. Like, oh God, what are the Matildas going to look like without their captain, their striker, Sam Kerr, who was in such incredible form with Chelsea coming into the tournament. Uh, so it was a really complex moment for a lot of us, I think, because we were going into this amazing milestone moment of this opening match, this World Cup on home soil, but we were going to be doing it without maybe our most iconic footballer of all time. Um, yeah, so it was uh, emotionally for me, having come to women's football as a fan first and a journalist second, there was a, there was a lot of like processing that I had to go through in those two hours before kickoff. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, when do you think it really, the Matildas really realized that they could be doing something even without Sam Kerr? I think the moment the Matildas realized that they were more than just Sam Kerr was in the third group game against Canada. That was a really important game for Australia because we had lost the previous match against Nigeria. And in order to get through uh, as the best place team in that group, we had to beat Canada. We had to beat Canada. And Canada were at that point the reigning Olympic gold medalists, having won the gold medal in Tokyo. Uh, they were defensively fantastic. They had one of the icons in women's football of Christine Sinclair. They had talent all over the field. And we had to beat them without Sam Kerr. It was a really stressful period for a lot of us. But I remember attending that match in Melbourne and 
there was just some different kind of feeling about it. I think that the absence of Sam Kerr almost gave the players more drive and more motivation to try and get as far as possible in order to give her time to get back, in order to give her an opportunity to try and miraculously recover from this calf strain in order to join the team that she has been the figurehead of for such a long time. I mean, this was meant to be Sam Kerr's tournament, right? The captain of one of the host nations, uh, one of the most famous, most most expensive, most popular footballers on the planet. And all of a sudden she was sitting on the sidelines having to watch this tournament pass her by. And talking to a lot of the players over the course of this tournament, a lot of them did acknowledge that Sam Kerr, her injury really did give them an extra energy to try and do as much as they could in her absence. But what I think the Canada game did is it actually showed not just us, but also the Matildas, that they can still be a really successful, really powerful, really fantastic national team, even without this player that has largely defined them for the last four or five years. So that match against Canada, you saw players like Hayley Rasso step up. You saw players like Caitlin Ford or Kyra Cooney-Cross or Katrina Gorey step up. You saw a lot of players who had kind of been sitting in the shadows of Sam Kerr for a while really come to the fore and really drag and pull the Matildas into the knockout stages with that 4-0 win. Um, Canada really didn't have a chance, I think, especially with that incredible home crowd down in Melbourne. I mean, I I saw maybe a scattering of Canada fans, but it was just a, a green and gold wave of Matildas fans and they were loud for the entire 90 minutes. It was like having a 12th player on the field out there with them. It was so amazing to witness. It was one of my favorite ever football matches to watch. And then, of course, they move out of the group stages, they beat Denmark, and then there's this ominous game against France with the whole penalty shootout and everything. What was that like for you? (laughs) I still struggle to describe the France game. Um, it, it was it was like it was two games in that happened in the one moment. There was the there was the ninety minute game and the little bit of extra time. That was sort of the first game, and then the second game was the penalty shootout, which when we were there in the middle of it, it felt like it was going to last forever. I felt like I was going to wither away in my chair watching that shootout happen. Um, it it was it was a remarkable match and I feel like a lot of people when we reflect back on that game we don't really remember the game in the way that you kind of remember games we don't remember like the you know the chances that were created or um any of the kind of like match report you know kind of memories of it but for me anyway I think our memories are really driven by the emotions of that shootout of the fact that there were so many little storylines threaded throughout all of those shots that were taken. There were misses by players you'd think would bury their penalties. There was a goalkeeper who came up and and took a penalty and had to get it retaken after it came off the post and then stood back on the goal line and saved another one. There was there was so much stuff that happened in the course of that shootout <laughs> that it was it, it kind of constituted its own game, and you know it it's it was the longest ever penalty shootout in World Cup history for women's or men's. I don't even remember now the number of penalties that were taken in total, but the the tension in the stadium was so high that by the time it got to the last one and it had been going back and forth, back and forth, you know, goal after goal after goal. So it was sudden death by the time we got to this one moment. And Courtney Vine, who was the the younger Matilda, she'd only really come into the setup in the last 12 months. She still played semi-professionally for a club here in Australia called Sydney FC. Now, I'd been watching Courtney Vine for a number of years, even all the way down to state level where she wasn't hardly even getting paid. And now I was watching her step up to take what could potentially be the winning penalty for Australia to make history and get them through to their first ever World Cup semi-final. And when the ball hit the back of the net, I 
don't I, I it, it was all kind of a blur I don't really remember what happened I remember I was trying to film it on my phone because my journalist brain just had to turn off and I had to go back into <laughs> fan mode because that was the only like it was just like you know it was like one of those moments where I have to experience this as a fan because that's the only way I'm going to be able to embrace it properly so I was filming I was filming the penalty the ball hits the back of the net my phone goes flying you hear me screaming the whole stadium erupts like you felt the ground underneath you shaking there were chairs that went flying from Australian media, people hugging each other, the Matildas whirling away, <laughs> celebrating. It was it was just this absolute moment of complete ecstasy from however many tens of thousands of people were there. And I burst into tears. My friend next to me burst into tears. It was, just, it was just one of those incredibly charged emotional moments that you really only get a couple of times, I think, in your whole life in sport. Um, but what I loved was that the next day after I woke up from the sort of drunkenness of the, of the feelings, I looked at my phone, I was looking at social media, and there were all of these videos that had been published of millions and millions of Australians around the country watching this game. There were there were videos from live sites. There were videos from lounge rooms. There were videos from pubs and hotels and other other competitions like AFL and, and, and NRL, like people in those stadiums went outside to watch this shootout on the TVs, on the concourses. There was even footage of people on an aeroplane. All of these videos sort of like, like splashed across my timeline at once. And I burst into tears again because it was it was just one of those incredible reminders that the whole country was engaged in this one moment together. We were experiencing the same emotions and watching the same extraordinary women do this thing together. There are very few moments that you get in in that kind of way as a country. And and that France game, that penalty shootout is is it's like it's gone down in history as the most watched uh women's football match ever in Australia. Um, and I think for a very long time, it's going to be remembered as one of the greatest moments that we've ever experienced in Australian sport. I want to ask you about the aftermath, maybe two things. One, do you think that the public really thought at this point, because obviously Australia came into this as kind of underdogs, but also could potentially be doing something at the World Cup. Sam Kerr is missing, then of course she comes back, but... Do you think the public really believed that they could maybe go to a final? And also, do you think the team really believed it at this point? Mm, it's a great question. The, the tricky thing with the Matildas is that for those who've watched them for a very long time, they've always felt like they had the ability to go far in a tournament. But at the very same time, they've always felt like they could get bundled out in a group stage. And both <laughs> of those futures seem just as likely as one another. So being a Matildas fan is a real balancing act sometimes. It's, it can drive you insane because you can think one thing and the other thing happens. Um, and I think coming into this tournament, there were some folks who were who were teetering on that on that edge as well. Like we could go very far here or we could crash out at the earliest the earliest point that any host <laughs> nation has ever crashed out of a of a World Cup. Um so it was pretty frightening coming into to, to the uh, the opening game and the and the group stage, especially after that that loss against Nigeria. But I think the I think the turning point for the country and potentially the turning point for the team, even though the team had said publicly a lot that they believe that they can do it, they have such faith in themselves to be able to go far. I think the moment that they actually started believing it, and the moment that the rest of the country started to believe it was probably the France game. And I want to talk to you about the whole after the World Cup as well. But first, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you about the England match. Um, <laughs> because, of course, I remember watching that game and when Sam Kerr hit that unbelievable strike and I remember thinking, okay, this is it, they can actually do it. And I can only imagine what it was like in the stadium when that goal went in and maybe you can as you've done brilliantly before, talk us through that match as well a little bit. Yeah, gosh, the England game. Um, I still 
have nightmares about that game sometimes. <laughs> um, look, yeah, I think the that game was really important, I think, because it was finally the moment that we had all wanted for Sam Kerr. You know, we'd been waiting to see for that whole tournament whether she would make it back in time to appear even just once to do just just one thing, something magical that we know that Sam Kerr is capable of doing. But it was deeply sad to me that with all of the build-up to the World Cup, with her being who she is, being the face of the team and the tournament, that it felt like she wasn't going to get a chance to soak it in. You know, she wasn't going to get a chance to really feel what this thing was like. And so when we found out that she was going to be starting in the England game, um, I was a mix of extremely relieved, but also really worried because she could either do something brilliant or because she has been wrestling with this injury, because she hasn't played much for a while, she could do nothing. And I felt like doing nothing was almost worse than sitting on the bench and watching the rest of her team try to do something. But thankfully, and unsurprisingly, really, <laughs> Sam Kerr did what Sam Kerr does. You know, she is a player who knows how to show up in a big moment. And what bigger moment could you ask for than a semi final against the Lionesses? You know, these are players that she knew, she played with and against a lot of them over in England with Chelsea. She's shown up in FA Cup finals against them, particularly Mary Earps. She knows how to handle a moment like that. And her goal was the absolute epitome of what Sam Kerr is capable of doing and what she means to the team. Because by that point, the starting players that had been used really regularly for the Matildas were exhausted. You could tell really from the opening whistle that they were pretty cooked. But Sam Kerr had a different kind of energy to her, right? Because she hadn't played the last four games. She was here ready to go and she had a point to prove, right? She, she'd had all this emotional buildup and she knew that she needed to be able to, to do something. And so the goal that she scored really was as though she just like dragged her whole team in a sack over her shoulder and just like, ran them forward and and tried to give them something and I it's her goal is really going to be burned into my brain forever I think I remember her on the halfway line receiving that pass from infield spinning around and then just taking off into the grass seeing all of this open space beyond her and I can remember feeling the stadium lifting I can remember the noise starting to build. Anytime she touches the ball, the noise started to build. But there was just something about this moment where she was running at Millie Bright, who was backtracking, you know, teammate on teammate, both friends at Chelsea. And there was, there was, they were trying to play this game of chess with each other with Sam Kerr sort of like doing some little feints and some little touches and Millie Bright trying to keep an eye on her and not step too far up because she knew she'd be beaten by Kerr's speed and not dropping too far back because she didn't want to give Sam Kerr too much room to shoot. And there was just a moment just as they got to the outside of the box where Millie Bright took one step back that was just too far. And Sam Kerr looked up and she saw Mary Earps where she was and she's been in that situation so many times and she was, I don't know what went through her brain. I think she was just like, you know what, let's just give it a rip and see what happens. And the ball left her foot and the whole stadium seemed to hold its breath and it rocketed over the top of Mary Earps. And again, the noise that boomed from the stands was something that I had never aside from the France game, never experienced before. You really did did believe. you Like that pocket of time, I think for maybe for the first time, people were like, we can actually win the World Cup. If this is Sam Kerr back, if this is what she can do, maybe we can really genuinely do this. Um, so that was a really glorious 15 minutes up until England decided to <laughs> come back and score more goals. But um yeah, look, it, it was, I don't think people in Australia at least will think about that game or remember that game because we lost. 
how do you think um more in detail it has changed women's football in australia of course there's the matillas uh, but then there's also the league system how do you think um it has impacted the league um well the matillas first i think it's really interesting the way that they have become an iconic australian brand and you know they've sold out the last 14 matches in a row in australia and I'm not talking small stadiums of five or 10,000. We're talking, you know, there were nearly 77,000 at the last match that uh, Australia played against against China um, in June. So, and and also the television coverage. I mean, the World Cup semi-final was actually the most watched TV program ever since records were kept in Australia. Not just the biggest sports program and bigger than all the men's sport, by the way, which is pretty big in Australia, but actually the biggest TV program ever since records were kept. But then, of course, after this big tournament, big crowds, big attention by the media and everything, there's always this question, okay, what happens after a tournament? And of course, the players get some time off, they go back to their clubs, but going back to their clubs for most of them means going to Europe, going to the US. For most of them, it doesn't really mean playing in the home league. Do you think that that is going or has changed a little bit after the World Cup that the league in Australia has been getting more attention or do you think it's kind of still at the same place? Interesting last 12 months. Um, I think off the back of a World Cup, you are always going to get a natural organic influx of attention and attendances and interest and investment. Um, which is, you know, I mean, that's transformational, really. That's stratospheric. And uh, people talk about the Matilda's effect. Every other sport wants to have a Matilda's effect. People have conferences about other sports and they talk about the Matilda's effect. <laughs> so it's really become a byword for progress and, um, a, you know, a transformed set of expectations around women's sport. So um, that's something that I think we are all very proud of. Um, in terms of the league, I think um, the league's numbers have gone um, north as well in the season since the World Cup. I think um, leagues are incredibly important to the growth of the game. I think we've seen national teams grow in importance and their funding and uh, you know their prize money and stuff has all, all gone up a lot. But I think where the real the real engine of change is actually what goes on in uh, professional and semi-professional clubs and leagues because, you know, it's what happens in between the national team tournaments that means that our players can improve so much. I mean, Sam Kerr is terrific because she's been for, for several years now at a good club with good coaches, good staff, um, you know, gymnasiums, doctors, etc., and it's made her... A much much better player than if she had been a part timer who was working in the day and kicking a ball at nights and on weekends. So I think the the professional leagues are really crucial as engines for um, elite development. And let's face it, it, it's those players that get kind of harvested by the national teams and and put in a national team jersey and who put on such a great show at the World Cup. If they weren't at pro clubs in between World Cups, the World Cup would be nothing like as spectacular as what it is. So, you know, there's ongoing efforts to try and make the league more professional. I think most players would be semi-professional rather than fully professional right now. Um, the length of the league, has it, it's longer so that, um, you know, players get sort of 20-plus games, 22 games rather than, a few years ago, they were getting 14 to 16. So, you know, these kinds of things are really important steps, but that's where the hard yards are done to uh, try and do the everyday grind. It's not just showtime once every four years. It's really um, the work of the leagues that is so important in taking the game to the next level. That's always going to happen. But I think what's really important for a home nation uh, who has a, a domestic league to try and capitalise off of that natural attention is putting in place things that can absolutely maximise all of the different avenues that can flow into the game. And unfortunately, I feel like the A-League women here didn't really do as much as it could have 
in order to capitalize on what the World Cup did and on the the Matildas effect, as it's known here. Um, it's still at this point uh, a semi-professional competition. It only runs for five to six months a year. Um, there's only 12 teams and uh, the vast majority of them are part-time players. Um, we did have a couple of the Matildas who were part of the Women's World Cup squad sign for clubs here. Uh, so Courtney Vine, as I mentioned earlier, became sort of the face of the league, of course, after that iconic penalty against France. Uh, she was um, one of the players for Sydney FC. We had uh, veteran goalkeeper Lydia Williams signed for Melbourne Victory alongside Alex Chidiak. Uh, we had Kaya Simon, who didn't make any appearances uh, during the tournament because she was um, recovering from another injury, but she was the sort of marquee signing for the Central Coast Mariners. So we had a, a number of Matildas who were used in that kind of strategic way to try and capitalise on the the popularity of the Matildas and try and get those people and that attention translated into the domestic league. Um, and, and it worked. You know, we did see record attendances. We saw the opening game of the season crack 11,000 people, which was the biggest ever attendance for a standalone women's game uh, in the competition, which was amazing. We saw memberships for women's teams skyrocket. We saw um, the overall attendance for the league go up. We saw broadcast numbers go up and streaming numbers go up. We saw all the, all the metrics start to go up, which was amazing. But that wasn't necessarily down to what the, what the league organizers did. I think it was just because of the Matildas. Um, and, and that's kind of frustrating because you only have one post-World Cup season and the afterglow of that tournament is only going to diminish as the seasons roll on, right? So you would really have hoped that knowing that this tournament was on the horizon, like we know, we knew that we were going to be co-hosting it for three years, right? So the people who were running the league had quite a runway to uh, yeah. to put some things in place to capitalise. Um, but they didn't do, I don't think they did enough, sadly. Um, so I'm really curious about how the A-League women is going to move forward. Uh, we know that there's going to be some more teams that are added um, as the league expands. Hopefully more rounds are going to be added as well. And then in the sort of medium to long-term future, it'll hopefully also become a fully professional full-time competition for Australian players because, you know, in Australia, as we've seen, the Matildas are box office. They are the players that everyone turns out to see. Just now we've finished a two game friendly series against China, which uh, smashed again, once again, the record for <laughs> the, the highest attendance for a Matilda's home game with 76,000 people. So the Matilda's effect is still really strong. And I think if the A-League women wants to grow and wants to really embrace the opportunities that the Matildas present to them, they have to be smarter about the decisions that they make and they have to prioritize women's football because at the moment they don't really prioritize it. They, they, they run both the men's and the women's competitions at once. And there's an interesting discussion starting to emerge now about whether or not it's worth keeping the women's competition bundled in with the men's or whether we should actually separate them and whether we go down the road of what America has done with the National Women's Soccer League, which is a standalone women's competition run by people who are just focused on women. Um, so I think our our football sort of ecosystem is still a little bit behind that conversation, um, but I think there is a lot of merit to that argument. Um, it just depends on money and time, as everything does. Can you maybe go a little more in depth on what prioritizing women's football more actually means? Because I think for me, that always sounds like, yes, of course, we want that. But I'd be so curious to hear from you what you think in detail that would look like. Question. So I guess to give like a broad overview of, um, of the domestic leagues here in Australia, we've got the A-League men's and the A-League women's. And the body that runs both of those competitions are owned by the clubs themselves. So there's not like an independent sort of governing body that can make decisions 
um, on behalf of all the clubs. The clubs are actually part of the decision-making process. So for some clubs um, who are largely the, the richer clubs, the clubs that have the most resources, those are the women's teams that tend to do very well because the people who are managing them have enough money to be able to accelerate that women's program ahead of other clubs. So we've got sort of a, a like a big four kind of similar to the Premier League, um, which are the 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 richest and the, the best resources, resourced women's teams in the country because they're connected to the best and and best resourced men's teams. But even then, that dynamic is really problematic because the women's like the the women's league still is not its own sustainable financial generator. A lot of the money still comes from the men's competition, and then it's um, it's divided or siphoned off, and part parts of that are given to the women. And that doesn't just include wages for players; it also includes staff members, it includes access to facilities, it includes um, the positions in broadcast deals, it includes and encapsulates a lot of different things. Um, and because the priority financially for the clubs and therefore for the league is the men's competition, that competition will always be prioritized in terms of decision making. It'll always be the competition that's first when you go into a negotiation with a broadcaster. It'll always be the competition that's first when you go to talk to sponsors about investment opportunities. It'll always be the competition that is front of mind when you're thinking about scheduling. Where do you put the most important games at prime time for the most viewers to be able to watch them? And so if you prioritize the men's game in that way, in your thinking, the women's game necessarily is second. It's the one that has to take the spaces that are left over. And that's the problem at the moment in Australia, I think, is that the people who are running the A-Leagues don't prioritize the women's game in the same way that they prioritize the men's game. The women's game will always have to get the seconds. And for a moment that we're in now around the world where women's football is really booming, I think there are much more creative ways in which we can reconfigure that relationship. Like I mentioned before, the USA have done a really interesting thing with separating their men's and women's competitions in lots of different ways. So not just in terms of their governance and having decision makers at the very top of the pyramid making decisions specifically for the women's game, but also club ownership, broadcast deals, sponsors, all the, the sort of the stuff that goes into a competition to make it successful, all of that stuff is decided by people thinking about women and what women need, what women fans like, what women players want. And that's really rare in in global football at the moment um, because women's football is still in this kind of fledgling stage where it does kind of still need in some circumstances the platform or the resources that a men's club can provide before it can find a way to be sustainable financially on its own. And that's where Australia is right now. The, the women's competition is, well, we haven't tried to see whether it has its own value, whether it can stand up on its own two legs. It's never, we've never been in a situation to be able to really test that because it's always been wedded to the men's game and to the men's clubs. And therefore its future has always been decided by men who are prioritizing men. And um, yeah, I suppose that's the big existential question that we need to ask ourselves, not just in Australia, but I think in, in other countries around the world as well is at what point should we think about, detaching ourselves from the men's game in order to really understand and capitalize on the, the the very special kind of value that women's football has, which is very different from what the men's game has shown it's got. And lastly, also briefly want to talk to you about the youth development system. You've also kind of already mentioned a little bit how you said that Sam Kerr became big kind of in spite of the youth development system. Can you tell us a little bit why the youth development, in your opinion, needs to improve and how it could improve? Yeah, the the, the pyramid in Australia, uh, particularly at the youth level and the development levels, is one of the biggest challenges that we face as a sport here. Unfortunately, the the financial ecosystem of football is such that uh, it costs a lot to play soccer. It costs a lot to play particularly when you have a talented child 
and that talented child is thinking about wanting to become a professional in their future. So you can play sort of regular community level grassroots Sunday league um, competitions, which are largely run by volunteers, um, but the registration fees can be quite high. You don't really know where a lot of it goes. It kind of just disappears into the Bermuda Triangle of the of the football pyramid. Um, and then the higher up you go in the levels, the more expensive football becomes. So there are stories of some folks who have wanted to put their kid, very talented 12, 13, 14-year-old kid, into a um, a development pathway, which is above the community level, but below the A-leagues. And they're having to fork out six, $7,000 a year in order to get that kid into that system. And sometimes there's no guarantee that they will even get any much further than that. So there's a lot of money that goes into from the from the playing side into engaging in football and developing in football. And that's a real problem because financial barriers are one way to keep talent locked out of the sport, especially talent from backgrounds like uh, migrant families, big uh, big families, low income families. Uh, Australia is a very multicultural place and we have a lot of multicultural communities, but unfortunately a lot of footballers or, or emerging talented footballers from those communities aren't able to reach their potential because the access to football development in Australia is so expensive. So that's one of the big, big issues that we're, we're struggling with as a sport at the moment is how we can completely reconfigure basically our financial uh, ecosystem in order to make football um, especially uh, sort of uh, like elite high performance pathways for talented kids, more affordable because the more kids that we develop, the more talent that is able to come through our systems, the more players we have who can reach the A-leagues, who can reach the national teams like the Matildas and the Socceroos and potentially win World Cups. So it, it all starts from the foundation of the pyramid, right, as it does everywhere. So that's one of the big challenges is the, is the financial aspect um, but another challenge is that uh, there, there's just too few um, opportunities at the elite level for players, particularly women players, to be full-time. Um, really the only full-time Australian women footballers that we've got are Matildas. And that is largely because of their contracts with Football Australia. It allows them to be year-round athletes. So you've got a player like a Courtney Vine who plays in a semi-professional A-League women's club, but she's able to be a full-time athlete because she supplements that with her contract with the Matildas. But for a lot of her teammates, especially her younger teammates, they still have to have second jobs. They still have to study. They still have to go to school. They still have to do all this extra stuff outside of their football just to make ends meet, just to be able to get by. And that's a real problem because it means that our league is not going to evolve and we are not giving these players the environments in which to improve because they are always going to be stretched across other um, priorities. And for some players as well, they may feel like they can't actually juggle all of those things at once. And so they might leave football altogether because they actually need a job and they need to survive. So that is its own kind of um, uh, blanket that suffocates the the potential that Australian footballers can have, especially on the women's side. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a lot of interlocking, intermingled challenges in the Australian football pyramid when it comes to developing youth players. Um, so from the the sort of the league angle of it, as well as from the the youth national teams, which. You know, there's a lot of overlap between the A-League women and the young Matildas or the junior Matildas who are under 20s and under 17s women's national teams, but they don't play a lot of football internationally. There's not a lot of competitions that are organized for them. It's getting better in the, the last sort of 12 months. There have been a couple more opportunities for those players to to go overseas and, and play against um, equal uh, national teams in, in those youth levels, but we still don't have enough. And that's kind of, if I was to summarize Australian football in a sentence, it's, we don't have enough. We don't have enough uh, money. We don't have enough clubs. We don't have enough pathways. We don't have enough players getting to the elite level. 
Uh, we don't have enough playing opportunities. We don't have enough coaches at high quality sort of standards to be able to um, educate and develop these players as well. We just don't have enough of all the things that you need in order to be a big football country. Um, so yeah, that's the, um, that's the unfortunate, I suppose. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the unfortunate aspect of, of being who we are as a, as a footballing country um, and competing with so many other sports, so many other priorities in Australian culture that um, we just find ourselves sort of stuck in the middle and constantly trying to figure out how to fix it. Lastly, I want to ask you two questions that we ask every guest. And the first one is a little bit more personal. You yourself, how did you get into women's football? I've been a football person for my whole life. I played football when I was a kid. Um, I remember starting out in boys teams because I didn't have any girls teams that were available to me when I was growing up. Um, I had a, a really uh, formative moment when I was about 12 or 13 years old watching the Socceroos play on TV um, back in 2005. They qualified for the, the Men's World Cup for the first time in 32 years after defeating Uruguay in a penalty shootout right here in Sydney. And that was the first time I remember watching a game of football and realising that it was so much bigger than me just kicking the ball around with my friends on the weekend. I remember watching that shootout and hearing my whole neighborhood erupting because it, we were all watching the same thing, it, it turns out. And I, I had no idea. So that was a real, um, that was a really significant memory for me because that was when I started to really pay a bit more attention to what was going on in football. Um, I started to become very fond of my local uh, representative team, which back in those days was called the MacArthur Rams. And I would go and play my games on a Sunday morning, race home, quickly eat something, and then drive out to, to watch the MacArthur Rams playing in the afternoon. And these, these players were extraordinary. Some of them were former Matildas, who a lot of people didn't know about. And they were playing like 20 minutes from my house in my own backyard in front of largely family, some friends, and maybe a couple of kookaburras who were sitting on the nearby fences. But there was no one there to watch these amazing players doing what they did. And I would go to these games and realize that no one was covering them. No one was recording them. No one was was archiving these incredible athletes and this amazing thing that they were doing. And at that stage as well, I was I think I was maybe nineteen or twenty. Um, they the MacArthur Rams were very successful. They had a number of Matildas. They were winning championships. They were doing lots of really great things, but you wouldn't know it because there was there was no coverage anywhere. So. What I ended up doing just out of a kind of righteous fury was I would go to the games and I would just do it myself. I would jump on my own Twitter account and I would start to live tweet games. I would come up with hashtags. I would take photos. I would take videos and I, just to have something, just some record of this thing that was happening, this incredible thing happening in my own backyard. So I did that for a couple of years and um, there was a, a moment where I was kind of noticed by a woman named Anne O'Dong who ran a website called The Women's Game, which was the first ever website dedicated to women's football in Australia. She found me yelling on Twitter about the <laughs> MacArthur Rams and about uh, the national, uh, the, the Women's National Premier League, which was the competition that they played in. And she contacted me and she was like, hey, I noticed that you're yelling about women's football on Twitter. Do you want to come over and yell about it on my blog? And I was like, sure. All right, whatever. Let's, let's give it a crack and see how we go. So I was in my, I think my mid twenties at that point. And, um, I, I started, that's when I, that's where it all sort of kicked off. I started writing blog posts, match reports, essays. Um, I would, I would, uh, do the social media for the women's game covering the A-League women's competition, which was known as the W-League back then. 
uh, I would, yeah, I, I just learned to write about women's football on this blog. None of us were paid. We all did it voluntarily. Um, and it was amazing. It was one of the, the most important um, work experiences that I think I've ever had in my life because I was thrown right into the deep end and had an amazing mentor in Anne who taught me the ropes. Um, and we, we just wrote and covered the sport in a way that we had always wanted it to be covered by other people. Um, and so I, it, it sort of flourished from there. We went, we moved from the women's game to uh, a new website called beyond 90. And that's when I sort of started to, to realize that maybe this was something that I could pursue a little bit more seriously. Um, so this was around 2019, again, going back to the very start of this conversation when I went to the Women's World Cup in France. Yeah, full circle. Um, and I I hadn't been paid for any of my writing up until that point. It was all volunteer for years. And then when I decided to go to France, um, I was just going over for a holiday to to be with a bunch of friends and to go to my first ever Women's World Cup. But while I was there, I had an opportunity to write for a website back here in Australia called Optus Sport, who were the broadcaster of the Women's World Cup for us. And they were just starting up, so they didn't have a whole lot of con like content on their website. Um, and they put a tweet out. Again, Twitter is it's like I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm indebted to Twitter for basically my whole career. But they put a tweet out saying, you know, we're looking for for interesting ideas for for people to contribute to the website. <clears throat> And I was like, well, you know, I'm going to the tournament that you're broadcasting. So why don't I write like a travel column about what it's like to follow the Matildas overseas? And they were like, yeah, sounds great. And I was like, oh no. Okay. Oh crap. Okay. I have to actually do this now. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up going to France and, and writing a series of stories about my experiences following the Matildas through the, the World Cup and um, got paid for it for the first time ever, which was incredible. And when I got home, I I had all these emails and, and messages from people saying, oh, we really loved your writing. Would you be interested in doing this about the Matildas or this about the W League or this X, Y, Z? And I was like, yeah, sure. Let's just <laughs> say yes and see how we go. Um, And so I kept saying yes to everything. And within six months, I was writing pretty regularly for a bunch of different outlets like The Guardian, um, ESPN, um, Optus Sport regularly. I was writing for some some domestic um, outlets here in Australia, ABC, which I now work for. And uh, yeah, it, it kind of all, it all took off from there. And lastly, of course, the second question, what are some of the hopes and maybe also fears you have for the future of women's football in Australia? Um, well, I hope that the um, game can continue to grow and professionalize and have the um, and, and follow through on the social impact that we've seen um, arise through the Matildas in recent years. Uh, I think fans of women's sport and especially women's football are changing the way that sport is consumed. I think if you look at men's professional sport, there's it's got a kind of a an edge to it, a hard edge to it, which is, uh, I mean, frankly, I think some people buy a ticket to to men's sport so that they can express their frustrations and be angry and uh, and it's kind of a lottery. If they win, then you know it's a great weekend. If they lose, then you're really angry and miserable, and. You know, I think in women's sport, it's different. Uh, after the World Cup games, I mean, even I, I, mean, I went to the germany Columbia game where the Germans unexpectedly lost at the end, but their fans weren't angry or beating people up. They were sad, of course, but the, re the reaction is more sadness rather than anger and revenge and demanding that somebody be fired or saying that they're terrible and attacking them on social media. I think there's really a, a much more balanced way in which sport is consumed and women's sport particularly is this opportunity to celebrate progress and to cheer on the people who have come to emblematize that that process. I think what the World Cup showed is that Australia 
is a football country if you give them football in the right way. And the history of Australian football really is a lot of different people having a lot of different versions about what football should be and how it should look and how we should deliver it to fans. So my hope is that the game here arrives at a point where we are all finally aligned and we can see the same picture and we agree on the same approach to the same questions and the same challenges that we've had for decades, especially in the women's space. I think because that is the biggest growth opportunity that football has here in Australia, that's the space where I would really love to see targeted, dedicated resourcing, decision-making, strategy, people who really understand the culture of women's football, the fans of women's football, the commercial opportunities, people who get it in positions to be able to make decisions about it. Because I think that's one of the the biggest challenges that football everywhere faces really is that a lot of the time it's people people find themselves in positions of power who don't really have the right picture in mind. They don't really make the best decisions for the sport. Um, So I, I would love to see that. I would just love to see, as I said earlier, more. I just want more of everything. I want more games. I want more money. I want more sponsors. I want more media coverage. I want more opportunities for youth players. I want more people to be playing it at the grassroots level. I want more coaches, especially women coaches, to be paid. I want just more of everything. And the Women's World Cup and what the Matildas have done has shown, has proved to us as a country that more is possible, but we just have to believe it and we have to have the people in the right positions to be able to make the decisions in order to make more a reality. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. Go check out our other videos on other countries we've covered, for example, the Philippines. The next episode will be about Colombia and we'll be happy to have you back.